Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. Our scripture reading this evening comes from Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. This is the message translation. Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. The prayer that we used as our call to worship, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given, That prayer comes from a book of prayers by a man named Ted Loder. He's one of my favorite authors of prayers. And I was recently introduced to another book he wrote. Most of his books are just collections of prayers, but this book is called Tracks in the Straw. It's a series of reflections on the nativity. The genesis of the book, though, he said, came during a very difficult year in his life. That particular year, his first marriage was coming to an end. And he said, not only were my wife and I hurting, but our children were hurt and confused and angry. I was worried about my professional career, he says, worried that this divorce was going to sidetrack or endanger my career as a pastor. On top of that, his mother was dying, and then his daughter called to tell him that she was dropping out of college because of long-standing personal problems that had tormented her and she needed to take, off, take time off in order to deal with them. He said as soon as he received the call from his daughter, he dropped everything and arranged to meet her in the city at a restaurant she liked in order to be with her in whatever way she would allow him to do that. But as he was driving into the city that dark night, he said he just had these little snippets of songs running through his head. The the one line was Paul Simon slip sliding away. But he said the song, uh, the line that kept repeating most in his head was R.E.M. It's the end of the world and and as we know it. And I feel fine. He said he kept repeating the line over and over in his head, but that last bit of it, he couldn't repeat because life was ending as he knew it, but he didn't feel fine at all. I neglected to say, I should have gone without saying that this was the Christmas season when all this stuff was hitting at once. And he said, so as I drove into the city, I drove through a shopping district that was lit up with decorations and everyone's, you know, selling and, and, and all the shoppers were hustling and bustling, trying to get last minute gifts, or maybe just people were out strolling, enjoying the lights. He said, but as I drove down that street and looked at all the lights, he felt completely detached from it. Like, like almost like it was an, he was an outside observer. He could see all the stuff, but it wasn't meant for him. It was meant for someone else entirely. He said, it all just felt very strange. Have any of you ever had a Christmas like that, where it just felt detached from it all? It was meant for someone else. That's how he was feeling. The restaurant, he said, was in a kind of a crowded district. And so he had to park a few blocks away. And, and, and between the parking space and the restaurant where he was going to meet his daughter, there are a bunch of row houses, he said. And as he was walking along the row houses, he noticed one of the windows that was larger than all the rest. And in that window, there was a nativity scene. 
He said it wasn't just like a small little nativity scene like most of us display in our house. It was a big nativity scene, like three, four feet figurines all lit up from within and illuminated. The kind of thing you'd normally see in a storefront window, not in someone's living room. And and he kind of paused, looked at it, but then continued on his way. And his first reflection was just, you know, to remark at the piety of this family that sacrificed their living room and their privacy to display the nativity for the whole neighborhood. But then he kind of went on his way and he met his daughter for dinner. And he talked to her and he listened as best he could, tried not to pass any judgment, tried not to say anything that would upset or push her further away, offered what support he could, asked her to call if she ever needed him, warned her, please don't do anything desperate. We're always here. But ultimately hugged her, told her he loved her, and felt completely and utterly powerless to do anything about the stuff she was going through. He said as he was walking back to his car after dinner, he felt that he was at his lowest point. And that's when he walked back by that nativity scene again. And this time he paused and looked at it, and he noticed something strange about the nativity, that there was no manger in the picture. There were angels, wise men, shepherds, cattle, all gathered around Mary and Joseph. But normally all those things are gathered around the manger, but there was no manger in the scene. And in fact, the orientation of all the figures is as if they were looking out on the street exactly in the spot where he was standing. And in that moment, he said he had this flash of insight and he realized the street is the manger and I'm standing in it. He writes, those silent lighted figures were looking expectantly out on the street for the Christ child, out on the street where the beasts are all motorized now and the milk comes in cartons and the lamb's wool comes in worsted suits and the homeless like shepherds still sleep on steam grates and people like wise men dish out food in soup kitchens or work in political movements or business coalitions or churches to change things so someday there might not be homeless people or hungry children or addicted parents. And I stood there with tears in my eyes. With a force that lumped in my throat, I realized that just where I was standing, the Christmas miracle happens in the street where human traffic goes endlessly by, where men and women and children still live and limp and play and cry and laugh and love and fight and worry and curse and praise and pray and die. Just there, Christmas keeps coming, silently, insistently, mysteriously. I turned and walked back to my car, the mystery of it making me lightheaded and lighthearted. I laughed to myself as I thought about a wild stable, always being close at hand in this wild world, about the strange saving birth taking place in unlikely places like the street where I was walking. I love the imagery that he uses. I love the way he overlays the familiar imagery of, of the stable the wise men, the shepherds, the cattle. He overlays that against the world that we all know and live in, a world where there are traffic endlessly passing by and people hustling and bustling about their day. And for him, the two were one. But I love most what that vision gave him. Because remember, before that, he was feeling detached. Like, whatever this Christmas stuff is, it's not for me, it's meant for someone else who's not going through all the personal trouble and turmoil that I'm feeling right now. But once he had that vision, he realized that Christmas is for him, that he was standing in the manger, that he was included in the story, that God's love, the promise of Emmanuel, God with us, was for him. I don't know about you, this Christmas season, I asked earlier if you could relate to ever feeling detached. And if you're feeling detached or disconnected this Christmas season, I hope you can hear what Ted was trying to say is that 
is that we're standing in the street. We're standing in the manger. And it's exactly for us and for our brokenness that Christ entered the world. We are not detached or disconnected from God's love. I spent the better part of my day today out visiting people in our church. I've been in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, in hospital rooms, and in hospice care center. And with each person I've visited, I've tried to articulate to some degree that promise of Emmanuel, God with us. The reality is all those people I visited, they didn't choose to be in those places, not around Christmas. Like honestly, if you were to ask them where they were is the last place they'd ever want to be. But I think about Mary and Joseph. They didn't choose the stable. The stable was where they went because they had no choice left. And I don't know if I ever articulated this very well in those rooms I was in. But at least in my own heart, I tried to close my eyes and imagine that this room, these beeps, these whirls, all these sounds and machines, this too is the stable. And this bed is the manger through which the Christ child enters. And wherever we may be, even in this moment, in this sanctuary, in this place, this too is the stable. This too is the manger. And we're standing right in it. And Christ still comes to offer us hope, to enter into humble and mean places in order to give us light in the darkness. In James chapter five, it says, are any among you discouraged? Are any of you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them, anoint them with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And the Lord will raise them up. And if they've sinned, they will be forgiven. And so that's what we're going to do in just a moment, is we're going to have a time of anointing. You're invited to come forward as you feel led, and Perry and I will each be anointing and praying over you for God's peace and love to enter your heart this Christmas season. It's not magic oil. It doesn't automatically make hard times go away, but the oil is a sign. It's a sign of God's blessing, It's a sign of God's hope and peace. It's a sign that you are included in God's love and care. It's a reminder that right where you are, you're standing in the manger and God's love is for you. And after we anoint you, you're invited to go to the sides and we have Stephen ministers who are there to pray for you as well. And each of the Stephen ministers will have a shawl And they'll place that around you and wrap it around you as a reminder that you are held and cared for by our loving God, that his arms are wrapped around you. And following that prayer, you're welcome to take that shawl with you and carry it with you throughout this Christmas season. Any moment of prayer, any time you need to just be reminded of God's presence, just wrap that around you and remember God's love. Will you join me now in a word of prayer as we prepare to come forward for our anointing? O oh, gracious God, you promise that with the anointing of oil comes healing. And our prayer, God, is that you bring healing to each of our hearts this evening. Wherever we are experiencing brokenness, wherever we are grieving loss, with this oil may we feel the soothing comfort and touch of your love. Help us, O God, wherever we might be, to trust in your goodness, to trust in your grace. This may not be the Christmas we always plan and dream and that people sing about, but this is, O God, the place where you enter our lives. This is, O God, the place where our healing begins. Help us to come forward 
and receive your mercy and grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen.